Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering at the University of Calgary. And this is module 16 in my probability and stochastic processes lecture series, where I talk about the Poisson process. Now, a Poisson process is a counting process. And so the first thing we should do is define exactly what we mean by a counting process. And a counting process, <clears throat> is basically one that counts a series of events that occur at random points in time. And so it is a stochastic process. So it's a random waveform that's a function of time that we represent usually by n of t, or that's how I'm going to represent it. We consider only positive time. And basically, the value of n is the number of events that have occurred by time t. And some of the properties, some obvious, maybe some less so, is um, n, first of all, has to be greater than or equal to zero. It's also an integer valued stochastic process. It is also monotonically increasing. So for some time t greater than s, the value of the counting process has to be greater than or equal to its value at time s. And for some t greater than s, the, um, the difference between nt and ns is the number of events that have occurred in the interval from s to t. And so what's an example of a counting process? Um, often in statistical books, probability books, you see the example of customers entering a store. So the number of customers to have entered a, a store or business by a certain time would be a counting process. A little bit more relevant for electrical engineering and computer science might be the number of packets that we observe um, coming into a router, for example, on the internet. Um, and that's a, a, an example I'll come back to um, over and over again, because as it turns out, packet traffic on a lot of networks anyways can be modeled as a Poisson process. And there are a couple of properties of a counting process that um, may or may not be satisfied. The first one is a, a property that we refer to as independent increments. And if in the assumption of independent increments holds, then that means that the number of events that occur during disjoint intervals are independent. So if we have a timeline, it basically means if we define a time interval here, the number of events that occur in this first time interval is independent of the number of events that occur in the second time interval. This sometimes holds, sometimes doesn't, depending on what you're characterizing. So for example, if we were analyzing the number of packets stored in the buffer of a router on the internet, the assumption of independent increments might hold. So for example, if you know we have a large buffer compared to the number of packets that are arriving, um, you know, because traffic patterns are, are, are random uh, from one time instance to the next. The number of packets that we store in our buffer in you know, time increment one could very well be independent from the number that we count in time increment two. However, if we think of a slightly different example where the maybe we have you know, fairly intense traffic and the um, a buffer on our router is coming very close to being full, then independent increments might not hold because during time interval one, if we have a large number of arrivals, we might be very close to the maximum of our buffer. And typically when our buffer fills up, we just drop packets and we don't store them anymore. So if we fill up our buffer during time interval one and our buffer stays full until time interval two, the number of, um, stored packets that we count in time interval two will be much smaller because just simply because we don't have room. And so the large arrivals that have occurred, the large number of arrivals that occurred during interval one affects 
how many packets we can store in interval two, and obviously the um, that implies dependence. The second um, condition that may or may not hold is the condition of stationary increments, and this um, refers to the assumption that the number of events that we count depends on the length of the time interval that we're looking at and not where exactly that interval occurs along the timeline. So for example, if we sort of erase what we've got here, if we have a timeline T and we define an interval that is three seconds long, that starts at, let's say, um, time four. And then we have another three second interval that occurs later on, maybe at time 12. The number of events that can occur or the, the random distribution of the number of events that we can expect in those intervals would be the same because the length of the intervals are the same. And this is basically kind of similar to the, you know, our standard understanding of stationarity of, of um, stochastic processes, where the um, statistical distribution of the stochastic process is independent of where we examine the stochastic process along the, uh, the timeline. So it's this, this assumption is very similar to strict, stand, strict sense stationarity. And we can also think about the assumption of stationary increments in the context of our router example as mayor as possibly applying and possibly not depending on conditions. So if you were looking at router traffic over a relatively small interval, like let's say perhaps within an hour, um, the assumption of stationary increments probably would be fairly accurate. But if you were looking at, you know, let's say traffic on the internet over a period of 24 hours, there's fairly well established peaks and troughs of traffic intensity. So, um, for example, when everybody's at home watching streaming video, you notice a spike in the internet traffic, uh, people playing online games. But you know, once, you know, after midnight, the traffic really sort of dies off until the morning. And then in the morning, you may see, you know, an increase in traffic with people working or studying from home, for example. And so stationary, the assumption of stationary increments for internet traffic over the period of 24 or 48 hours, certainly um, in, many, in many situations would not be accurate. So if that's what a counting process is in general, a Poisson process is basically a specific version of a counting process. And it's probably the most common one, the most popular one, in particularly because, as I mentioned, we often use it to model traffic on networks. And network traffic is random because the packets sent over the internet basically depend on the applications being used to generate and receive those packets, as well as the user activity um, connected to those applications. So somebody playing an online game, the traffic would be a function of the activity of the game and the decisions being made by the player. For streaming video, compression tends to be, um, or the, the amount of data sent by video compression algorithms tend to be a function of how much activity there is from one frame to the next. So if you're looking, if you're watching a, a very active, perhaps an action movie, then you know your traffic might be relatively high, but if you go into a period where you know there's not a lot of difference from one frame to the next, traffic may, uh, may drop down a little bit. And so all of these factors go into the assumption that we model um, traffic on most networks as, as random. And uh, the Poisson process in particular has what we refer to as a rate. And so we represent the rate by the variable lambda. And there's a few properties of the Poisson process. The first one is that we assume at time zero, no events have occurred. So the value of our counting process at time zero is zero. The assumption of independent increments 
applies for a Poisson process and as well as stationary increments. And the number of events observed in an interval starting from time s to time t is a random variable, a discrete valued random variable with this PDF. And using this PDF, we can, um, for example, determine the average number of events that we expect at a, at a particular time. So specifically, we're gonna calculate the expected value of our Poisson process at time t. And so we can think of our time interval then as stretching from zero to t. And as I mentioned, this is a discrete valued random variable. And so the uh, expected value is calculated using a summation rather than an integral. And so we sum over n equal to zero to infinity. Um, n multiplied by the probability of n, which is for a Poisson process is given by e to the minus lambda t, lambda t raised to the power of n divided by n factorial. And in this derivation, we're going to make use of the identity sum n equal to zero to infinity y to the n over n factorial is equal to e to the y. So we're gonna make use of this identity. And in order to do that, the first observation we're gonna make is that we can, without altering the expression, change our summation to start at one because when n is zero, obviously the first term is zero. And what I'm gonna do next is pull the terms that are not a function of n out in front of the summation. So that includes e to the minus lambda t. We have our numerator lambda t to the n, and on our denominator, I'm gonna write n minus one factorial. And you, you'll notice that the term n has disappeared. And basically what's happened is the term n on the numerator has calculated the last number in our factorial sequence on the denominator, right? So for example, three factorial of course is one times two times three. But if we have n on our numerator, which in this case would be three, this three cancels this three, and then the result is um, equivalent to two factorial on the denominator. So hopefully that makes sense. Now at this point, I'm going to do a, um, a variable substitution. So I'm going to let k equal to n minus one. That means n, of course, is equal to k plus one. And so that's going to, when I substitute this into um, this summation, what's gonna happen is this um, starting term for the summation is gonna go to zero. The argument for this factorial will go back to a single integer rather than an integer minus one. And because n is equal to k plus one, we're gonna have an extra lambda t term in the, in the numerator. So let me just sort of put all that together. So e to the minus lambda t is equal to summation of k equal to zero to infinity. Our numerator is now k factorial. Our or sorry, our denominator is k factorial. Our numerator is lambda t oops, k plus one. 
And so we have an extra lambda t term that I'm going to pull out front. This term, thanks to our identity over here, is equal to e to the lambda t. This multiplied by the exponential term out front is going to be equal to 1. And so we get our final result. The expected value of our Poisson process at time t is just equal to the rate multiplied by t. And this suggests that as you increase t, the average number of events that you count um, increases linearly and continues to increase. And we would expect an increasing expected value because the bigger we make our time interval, the more um, events we're going to count with our counting process. So one thing we're often interested in from an engineering perspective, particularly network engineering, is the time between events in a Poisson process. Because this is basically the time between packet arrivals in our network, for example. And the notation I'm going to use to represent interarrival times is T sub n. And T sub n represents the time elapsed between the n minus 1th, get rid of that e, interval and the nth, or sorry, the n minus 1th and nth events where t1 is the the um the time of the first event so to me to make that a little bit more and then our, our sequence of inter arrival times is t1 t2 you know and so on so let's say our first value of t1 was five seconds t2 was equal to 20 seconds and t3 was equal to 10 seconds. So our sequence of inter-arrival times would be 5, 20, and 10. And again, this is the time between events. So if we were to plot this on a timeline, just to be clear, we would, our counting process starts at time zero. At five seconds, we have our first event after 20 seconds, or at time 25, we have our, our second event. And after 10 more seconds, or at time 35, we have our third event. So remember, the interarrival times are the, are the time between events. They're not the absolute time of occurrence. So uh, I mentioned off the top that uh, Poisson process counts events that occur at random times. And so it means this means that the interarrival times are themselves random variables. And it's very useful for us to understand what kind of random variables they are. And so to figure that out, we're going to start by looking at the first interarrival time, t1, which is the time from time 0 to when the very first uh, event occurs. And we know that this is a Poisson process. And so the probability that time t1 is greater than some value t is just equal to the probability that we have not yet observed our first event in the time interval 0 to t. And so this is equal to the probability that our Poisson process at time t is still equal to zero, right? Because if it's equal to zero, then we know that the first event occurs sometime later than t. And if we use the probability expression for the number of events that occur in a Poisson time interval, this probability is equal to e to the minus lambda t. And for this term, I've, I've just used that Poisson um, probability expression where n is equal to zero. And so the factorial term on the denominator is just equal to 1, and the lambda t to the n term 
um, is just equal to one as well because it's raised to the exponent of zero. And so this means that the interarrival time t1 is actually an exponentially distributed random variable. Why is that? Well, in general, if we want to determine the probability that t1 is greater than t, we integrate its PDF from t to infinity. And the only uh, PDF that's going to give us a value equal to e to the minus lambda t is the exponentially uh, distributed random variable PDF. And so we know that t1 is an exponential random variable. Well, what about t2? So because t2 is, we'll just draw a line there. Because t2 is the time between um, the first event and the second event, we have to use a conditional probability. So the probability that t2 is greater than some time t, given that our first event occurred at time s, this is equal to the probability of zero events in the interval s t, given that t1 is equal to s. However, this condition has no relevance um, because of the, um, the assumption of independent increments that holds for Poisson processes. So it doesn't matter um, what happened leading up to T, what's, what goes on from, or sorry, it doesn't happen what hap it, it doesn't matter what happened leading up to time point S. Um, what happens from S to T is independent of that. And so this is just equal to the probability of zero events, oops, in interval s t with no condition, um, which is just equal to, if we use the Poisson process um, probability expression, again, just for the interval from s to t, oh, sorry, um, I made a bit of a mistake here. This should be, rather than t, this should be s plus t. And oops, this should be s plus t as well. So using the probability of zero um, Poisson events from the interval s to s plus t, again, we get the probability e to the minus lambda t. And the only um, distribution that's going to give us that probability is the exponentially, um, or is the the exponential random variable PDF. And so, based on these, based on this argument, we say that you know the assumptions that are fundamental to a Poisson process lead to the property that the interarrival times of a Poisson process are exponentially distributed. And this. Um, or, or in other words, memoryless. And this hopefully makes sense because the assumption of independent increments, the assumption that you know what happened before has no bearing on what happens next, does suggest a memoryless property, right? So um, the interarrival, if the inter, if the arrivals and the interarrival times that came before a point. Um, are to have no effect on what goes on in the future, we imagine the Poisson process as kind of quote unquote restarting itself from a statistical perspective, which means that it is a, a memoryless thing. It doesn't matter what happened before. And so this um, idea of having uh, exponentially distributed interarrival times hopefully makes some intuitive sense as well. And finally, we should note that if you know, this is the, the probability expression for our exponentially distributed interarrival times. That means um, the mean value of the interarrival times 
is just equal to one over lambda. And that's just the expected value of the exponential random variable. Now, now that we've established that the individual inter-arrival times are exponentially distributed, then we can define something that we refer to as the wait time. And the wait time for event n is just the summation of all the inter-arrival uh, is the summation of the inter-arrival times of all of the events that came before event n. So, I mean, to be clear, or a, a bit more clear, hopefully, let's say we wanted to determine the wait time for event three. And so if this is time zero, S three represents the how long we have to wait for event three, or basically the absolute point on the timeline where event three occurs. Now, before event three can occur, event one has to occur, and event two has to occur. And the time between zero and event one is t1. The time between event one and two is t2. And the time between events two and three is, is t3, right? So the, the absolute time that we have to wait for event three is the summation of the, of the um, inter-arrival times. And since the inter-arrival times are independent, exponentially distributed random variables with the same mean, then the wait time is gamma distributed, as we saw in the, uh, the previous uh, lecture module when we talked about the exponential, um, exponentially distributed random variable. So finally, the last, there are, so I, I should say that the Poisson process, there are a ton of different properties, a ton of different variations of the Poisson process. We're really just kind of scratching the surface of it and looking at just a few of those properties. But one of the more useful ones that I wanted to mention just quickly is um, what happens when we have a Poisson process where the arrivals or the events being counted into or being counted by the process are divided into classes with a certain probability. And so let's consider a Poisson process n of t where each arrival uh, that's counted by the Poisson process is classified into one of two categories. As a, it can be classified as a type one event with probability p or a type two event with probability one minus p. And then let's let n1 and n2 represent the number of type one, of, or let's let n1 represent the number of type one events and n2 represent the number of type two events. Obviously, if we add n1 and n2 together, we get our original Poisson process. And it turns out that n1 and n2 are themselves Poisson processes where n1 has rate lambda multiplied by the probability p. So lambda is the original rate of the, um, or is the rate of the original process n. And n2 has rate one minus p multiplied by lambda. And this property can generalize into an arbitrary number of groups. So you can have three groups, four groups, and if you divide all of them based on certain probabilities, then each one of those, um, each one of the processes counting the number of events in each individual group will be Poisson. And um, as long as the, the probabilities of you know dividing each arrival into groups um, add up to one and there's a proof for this but it, it gets a little bit detailed so i'm just going to state this without proof here but if you're interested in the proof you know most good graduate textbooks on poisson processes will um, will go into this in a little bit more depth 